Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming to our webinar this evening. Uh, it's good to see a few familiar faces in the room. I'd just like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians on the lands on which we all meet this evening and pay my respects to their leaders past, present and emerging. Um, tonight, we have a very special guest with us, Greg Knight, is uh, down in the Illawarra branch from Renew. And he's gonna talk to us through um, the, the climate change plan that he came up with with the Wollongong City Council. So Greg is a technology and planning manager at Blue Scope Steel in his previous life, a metal, metal, uh, metallurgist by trade, a skilled in quality management, statistics, process improvement, and scientific method. He's active in the region with a bunch of other groups and projects and initiatives. And he's here tonight to explore the Wollongong Council Climate Change Mitigation Plan, which Greg led um, down with his branch. And it's actually from this magazine, which is Renew Magazine, which is kind of who's hosted us this evening and the group that both Greg and I join. And in that article was the emissions reduction strategy plan that um, Greg led and came up with. And it was this one that actually inspired me to create this group up here on the Gold Coast. So um, we'll have Q&A. There's a little chat box at the bottom you guys will be able to access. And that will kind of come through to us on the backside. And we'll be able to manage that. And at the end, we'll take some time and Greg will go through the questions and we'll get some answers for you. So um, without further ado, I'll hand it over to you, Greg. Thanks very much, Duncan. And uh, congratulations on starting a Renew group. Uh, I am uh, presenting here from uh, Darawal country. Um, and I would like to just briefly introduce Neville. If you could put your hand up, Neville. Neville, Neville actually wrote that article, the bulk of that article um, for the Renew magazine. So he's done all the hard work writing. Now it's my turn to do the speaking. So Neville will be just uh, watching on. Um, I'll just put my screen up now in the presentation. Uh, so I'm going to talk, it's, it's more of a story um, about Renew Illawarra's involvement in the Wollongong City Council in the development of the climate change mitigation plan. So uh, it's by no means uh, the final answer and everything that you should do, it's just some of the things that we did and some of the learnings that we got from that. So hold on to your seats. There's a lot of slides in this presentation. Look, my goal for this session is to demonstrate the thinking behind the process. We learned quite a few things uh, after uh, events happened. Uh, we're going to talk about some of the things that we tried to uh, to get their attention and and what we learned. This all started in uh, 2019 and just before COVID started. So a lot of this work was done indoors, you know, while we we're locked down. So the council started in a pretty good place. They um, they had already by the by December 2019 declared a climate emergency. They'd signed up with the Global Covenant of Mayors. So they're they're a worldwide organisation, central centralised in Europe. And they've got some uh, undertakings for, uh, so they've got a process for the councils to follow in order to stay part of that uh, covenant. Uh, our councils joined the Cities Power Partnership, which is a, an organisation that has council members and not ordinary members. So uh, they have a large, a, a lot of resources the council can access in their journey to uh, reduce greenhouse gas. Uh, when you ring them up, we don't get a lot of information from them. So, you know, they're, they're focused at uh, working with councils. Uh, the council resolved to develop a climate change mitigation plan. Uh, we thought that was a fantastic idea. And as they did that, they engaged Iron Bark Sustainability, a, uh, a metrics company, a, a probably accredited to quantify the level of greenhouse gas and make an estimate of the annual reduction required to reach net emissions 
for the Wollongong area by 2050. They do it for uh, most of Australia, I believe. So our goal was to work with council and develop an effective plan that allowed the community to reduce the city's emissions. So this is a, there's a process from the Global Covenant of Mayors, starting from making a commitment, assessing impacts, sets targets and goals, uh, implement, monitor, validate. And so we're around this part here, um, implementing stage. So we're not finished this total journey. So the part that we're looking at is that a green box area that's now been um, amplified. So they've made the commitment the process is to assess the impacts and risks so that um, Ironbark Sustainability Report was a good starting place for that. Set targets and goals, so the council did that in their draft and we also set some other ones and then developed some climate actions and an adaptation strategy. This plan was actually, they've got a mitigation plan and separately an adaptation plan. So. What is the challenge? Where do, where do they start? So Ironbark uses an agreed methodology to calculate Wollongong's share of the greenhouse gas and the required reductions. So what they did was figured out to um, keep within target, they figured out how much CO2 the world could emit and then divided that by time and then the population part of the city of Wollongong with a couple of adjustments. Um, this, I've got this on the last slide, so you can take a picture of that uh, finally. So what they put in their report for Wollongong was that the, the re remaining budget was 45 million tonnes um, that we were allowed to consume and then we were over the, over the target. Um, that's about 2.7 million tonnes per annum and in order to meet, you know, stay within that 49 million tonnes remaining limit, we need to remove 74,000 tonnes from the system each year. So if you put like my solar panels remove six tonnes per year, so the six tonnes goes towards that. Um, and in the next year, you know, we need more solar panels to keep on reducing it and have that linear target. If we did nothing, um, this budget would be consumed within uh, 18 years. So there's a few questions on this. Um, you can't just pick these numbers up and use them straight away. We've got uh, Blue Scope Steel here in our area. They um, emit around 9 million tonnes. So clearly they're not in it, but the, the numbers are uh, uh, quite large for the area. So with a bit of investigation, we're pretty sure that the Blue Scope Steel contribution is included in some of these calculations because Ironbark used um, the electricity consumption for the area. So it was the purchased uh, electricity that uh, Blue Scope Steel used is included in this budget. Um, there's a question raised, which IPC C target were they um, aiming for and it turns out it's a 2% one a lot of our citizens were not happy and they were wanted sorry wanted the one and a half percent target my apologies and when does this reduction when does this linear reduction commence is it 2018 or 2020 and it, it um, turned out to be 2018 so we need to understand even those numbers that were given to us what they really mean. That was one of the lessons for us. It took a fair bit of analysis to understand that. Um, the council also supplied some more breakdown uh, by source type. What, how, what were the emission source types? So this is the stationary energy from power stations. Most of it probably cold, cold, fire, cold fired power stations. And also emissions from transport. And again, Wollongong, because of the heavy industry, We've got trains, a lot of coal trucks, uh, and of course, private transport as well. Uh, there's another graph here. Who is using it? Industrial. So there'd be a fair amount of the blue scope in there. Residential. So it's quite a substantial size. The, uh, the residential usage is about 20%. 
and commercial is around 8%. Uh, so as I said, it appears that Bluescope Steel's purchase electricity, but not their other emissions, are uh, a major component. Now we've put these out of scope. Bluescope um, has their own climate change and mitigation plan. So we're, we're not going to try and help them do anything. They, they pretty much know what they're needing to do anyway. So the remaining target areas for us, the big ones, are still industrial and commercial electricity. So part of this green um, sector, residential electricity, the blue one, and commercial, the red one, and then transport as well. So these are the things we're expecting to find action items in the um, climate change plan. So the council called for public comment uh, for the climate change plan before they started you know, doing the planning operation. So we thought, okay, here's a chance for us to contribute. We got, uh, we called a renew um, Illawarra meeting. We, we've got a mailing list of around 300 uh, highly skilled people. About 30 people came to our climate change one, a, a planning meeting. And we also had two of the council planning staff who were going to write the plan were there as well. So that was that, that was quite pleasing. The process we used was to to brainstorm local climate actions. And you can see a picture of the brainstorms uh, put down on plastic tables and we're starting to group these up. We organized them into groups in, and they turned out to be seven broad categories. Then we asked for volunteer group champions to write the chapter on each of those seven chapters and gave them a, a pro forma. Um, asking them what the background was, what what actions, what the council needed to do, what the public needed to do, what resources it might take up. Then we edited that and published our booklet. Didn't have much time, so we, here's our submission to the Wollongong City Council. 55 pages, seven areas of improvement, and we, we built that within 10 days. The next biggest submission was um, three pages. So we got their attention um, and we spoke on the local radio about that. I'll talk to you about that later. So the council went away and the planning staff went away and, and drew up a draft plan and published that. You can see the, here's the cover of it, the draft climate change mitigation plan. So we had a look at that, reviewed it. How does this draft, we had some questions, how does the draft address the challenge? What is the cumulative effect of the action? So we're looking to try and remember the 70,000 tonnes that we had to reduce for this year. How does it affect that? How much of that is affected? What is missing? And what are the most cost effective actions that you could do to uh, achieve that effect? So let's just pause for a second here. This cost effective, we need to talk about that for a second. It, it depends how you implement the, the actions. So we'll flick to the next page. So what I've got here is a, a notional um, effect of time and magnitude if the measures were installed in 2020. So if you're gonna reduce everything and put those plans in at the beginning of 2020, this is sort of how they would be affected. So if we started to say, right, we're gonna have renewable energy, solar panels, um, power purchase agreements, whatever, that would take some time to implement, but they would, they would kick in reasonably quickly by around 2030, we're just guessing, this is just notional, um, and then you know, carry on to 2050. For new building codes and existing building upgrades, they could change the legislation today but they don't have much effect until the renovations occurred or until the, you know, you've got a significant population of new buildings in. So they don't kick in for a long time, even though you did, we, we, we do need to do it as soon as possible. Green transport, we saw some data that said there's the majority of cars will be electric by 2035. So it will 
probably follow this sort of curve. And the Waste and Recycling Council, Council's responsible for that and they had some plans to impact that early on. So you can see the curve looking like this. So what is quite clear, um, sorry, let's just have a look at this for this for a second. So each ton of CO2 eliminated here removes, 20, removes 30 tons from the remaining budget. Each ton of CO2 removed here only removes 10 tons. So it's quite imperative that we start reducing that budget as soon as possible. It's quite urgent. And it, this gives us the breathing space to get these things happening. Uh, otherwise, they will arrive late. One thing we also wanted to consider, they're talking about uh, the growth. So there's population growth. But with, with the electrify everything, um, electrification of transport, the hydrogen hub that's going to be built at um, in Port Kemba and the LNG terminal, the emissions are going to ri arise as well. So not only do we have to mitigate the things that we're doing now, we actually have to um, do more mitigation to overcome the effects of the growth. So there, there is a lot of urgency. So many actions will have a delay before the, the effect is realised. Now, um, we need to look for actions that, so that the council is able to do. They're more influences. They don't buy solar panels and put them on your roof. They're, they're putting solar panels on their roofs, for example, and that has a, a an effect, but only a small one. But they've got they're in a perfect position to influence. So the things that we'll be asking them to do are influencing and sort of programs to um, affect the climate change. So there's our previous slide. What's the most cost-effective actions? Our recommendations for the draft plan for Wollongong. Number one, promote power purchase agreements for industry and commercial. So this is where um, uh, Melbourne has done it. Uh, Canberra has done it. They've said, OK, we're going to get together. We want to buy this much renewable energy in the next 10 years will go under contract to somebody who will build us a wind farm or a solar farm or whatever. Um, and what that does is puts infrastructure there that is removing the carbon from the atmosphere. So that's one of the most powerful ones. The second one is encourage solar panel <coughs> installation for residents. Our residents have been um, they're pretty average uh, installers for Australia. So they were up to about 20%. I think we're up to about 25 now, but we really do need to accelerate that. Once we start to, sorry. Once we start to accelerate the solar panel installation, we start to get into um, uh, a bit of a tight spot like Adelaide has done where they, at lunchtime, in summer, they get too much solar energy and it, it becomes a problem for the power companies. What we need to do is install community batteries to soak up that, that solar and then um, redistribute it at night when it's dark. Now, community batteries are different to the, the very large battery that they have in South Australia. We're talking about ones that are Within the suburbs, they're about you know, they fit into um, easily fit into shipping containers, and they use community power. Sorry, soak up community solar and then feed it back at night. And that's quite a different proposition. You, for example, you don't pay full grid charges, which is about half the cost of electricity. Um, it's quite a different proposition to having a, a grid battery like has been installed in uh, South Australia. We also noticed that um, the council's plan was a bit short on uh, measurement, quantification of what their actions were doing. So we were, we were pushing that fairly hard. So that was, we've reviewed the plan. Now, what are we going to do about it? We're in the middle of COVID. So what we did was run a webinar. It's about all you can do. <laughs> so we needed to encourage wide support for the suggested modifications. So we needed a lot of uh, high quality submissions um, into the, the council's plan. So we developed a presentation. So it was about 30 attendees 
at the webinar, including other climate groups. Um, the Nature Conservation Foundation got involved, um, Wollongong Climate Action Network and the water people. Um, so we had a presentation, which you can see the micro slides here, but it's, a lot of it's quite technical. Changing the climate is a lot technical. So we presented the rationale for selected recommendations, why we chose the recommendations that I just showed you on the page before. We quantified the impact on the carbon budget. So you can see this was the simplest thing I could do is get a, quite a complicated spreadsheet up in front of them. We outlined the simple steps they needed to take to make a submission and we gave them a pro forma. So, you know, uh, they could just get that and send it in. We had loaded it with, with the major recommendations, but we asked them, we encouraged them to change that wording so that each of the uh, um, responses to the draft were quite unique and then the, the council needed to pay attention to it. Uh, This was the final slide of that presentation. So the situation is urgent. Please apply a metrics, metrics to their, their plan. Please promote the fitment of solar panels on residential, commercial and industry. So that this is the council is promoting. Please facilitate a group power purchase agreement for the Wollongong local government area. And please facilitate a feasibility study on community batteries. You may not, everyone's talking about community batteries now. When we were talking about it, we had uh, the third member of our group was a champion of these and he's actually installed one in uh, DAPTO when he was in the uh, power company. So when we wanted to find out that things on uh, community batteries, you couldn't find it on the web very much. We did a whole lot of research and, and put in a, a a total, I guess, education package for the council on how they might do that feasibility study. Um, we found that um, it's very hard to get this information. We found that 46 of the 150 submissions to the, to the draft uh, recommended PPA. So we did have an impact. Six months later, the council's um, finished the plan renewed, reviewed the draft and uh, uh, made some changes. So they published the plan two days before the council meeting. So we had two days to have a look at it. Renew Illawarra, I spoke at the public for forum before the meeting. We get five minutes to talk. We gave them commendations on having a re reasonably good plan and highlighting some of the shortcomings. The councillors have the facility, we were talking to some of the councillors, they had the facility to modify plans such as these before they um, uh, pass them, commit to them. And we met with the councillors and said, we really need, you really don't want the council to uh, sign up to another um, non-green coal-fired electricity contract. We really need to, uh, build a power purchase agreement, get some more green generation happening and that'd be the new supply. And they did that. So the, the plan was accepted unanimously by council with this modification of the clause. So that, that uh, increased the impact of that plan by 15,000 tonnes. Just to put that into perspective, compare that to the 75,000 tonnes that we have to reduce each year. So that was a fairly big thing, but it didn't make a huge difference in the scheme of things. So that I guess that was the um, working with the council to make the plan and it took a year. The council took a year to write the six months to write the draft and six months to publish the, the final um, plan. Um, it's integrated into all of their other plans as well. This is uh, so a separate topic of coloured it blue to show that it's different. How do we do our marketing? Um, we did a 10 minute interview on the local radio, ABC radio. This takes a bit of homework. Um, this was, we spoke to the, the radio on the first book we published, the 55 pages in 10 days. To get that interview, 
uh, I spent the Sunday night writing a two-page essay that gave you know where we were coming from, why this is important, what we did, uh, and then could we get a um, a time on the morning radio slot? And we'd given him a, enough information to um, you know look like he's done his homework, which he had by reading this this part, uh, and then asked me a few few questions, including the, a curveball one. Uh, we had a 20-minute Zoom meeting with the Lord Mayor. What we wanted to do, we'd, the community batteries were so new that it was um, likely that they would be just dismissed straight away, never heard of them, not doing it. So we wanted to meet with the Lord Mayor. That was a whole other process. It took me five emails with his personal secretary and declaring that I was not... Um, uh, an agent for any commercial entity trying to sell him community batteries and we had a had a quite a, a good meeting for 20 minutes with the Lord Mayor uh, and when he undertook that they would have a decent look at community batteries. We had meetings with our uh, local state MP, our, our councillors and their local state MPs often are seen in a group on new things so they talk to each other a lot so we were impressed upon her the importance of um, having a strong plan. We met with councillors quite often. I'll talk about this in a minute. Um, we wrote newsletters to renew our renew members and other climate groups about what we were doing and, and how the progress was and uh, where to get the information that we were um, writing up. We spoke at the public forum at the council meetings. That's, that's also tricky. Um, I was lucky to be able to speak twice within a year. So we needed to find different speakers and um, uh, and then play games with the application process. We also wrote letters to council. I found a, a very good trick to uh, get them jumping is to write a paper letter with a stamp on it. It seems to make other processes occur and get much more attention than your normal email. So that was they were the major activities that we did during that uh, the COVID year of 2020. So what did we learn from it? I want to talk about um, it's quite difficult to to um, influence things like council plans. And this is, the council is a self-organising system, which is a, a bunch of um, individuals who do their own thing with their own rule sets. It is very difficult to change a self-organising system within, and it's even more difficult to change it from outside. So let's have a look at some of the components. The council is bound by legislation, a whole bunch of rules, budget, resource restrictions, priorities, and planning pressure and a whole lot of plans that, that need to be integrated. The staff on the council, the management has their own agenda. Those guys have got a whole lot of power on how things are going to turn out. I had a sense that um, the plan was going to have a, some nature. It's certainly going to um, clean up the council's emissions first as a priority. The, the staff, uh, sorry, those, the staff that were um, at our first meeting, they are planners. They have general expertise, but not uh, necessarily climate expertise. In my time talking to these people, they generally wouldn't divulge much. I, th I think they were constrained by what they could say. Um, we offered a lot of um, engineering expertise, um, community consultations, whatever, and a lot of that was not um, taken up. The councillors, they're our elected representatives, of course. They have a very, very complex prioritisation task, you know, the climate, health, um, uh, development, uh, footpaths, cycleways, traffic, all sorts of things. Um, so they've got a lot on their plate. Accordingly, they've got little time for research and they have restrictions on access to staff. They, they 
are not allowed to go and ask the staff to do, you know, change this part of the plan or whatever. That's uh, off limits. They can ask questions and see how they're going and and uh, drop some hints, but but no, there's restrictions on what they can ask of the, the council planners. Um, the climate campaigners, that's us. So within our group of the 30, we had wide technical and, and engineering expertise. We, um, of course, Bluescape is here. There's uh, uh, quite a number of retired, very competent, climate keen engineers. So what we don't know, if we don't know how to fix something, we can research and, and find the best solutions from the rest of the world. Mixed in with that, and this is a really good thing, is um, wide social and political expertise. How do we influence the public and the council to make these sort of changes happen? So we need to incorporate that. And a lot of that got written into our 55 page plan. That was, that was excellent. Uh, networks, if we didn't know something or wanted something to happen, we could just dive into our network and get that to occur. And there was quite a diversity of backgrounds. The residents, there, there's a lot of those, a lot more than climate campaigners, are mostly sympathetic, they have multiple priorities and are time poor. So generally they'll go along with you, but not have the time to help a lot. This ends up with um, sort of information flows that are not uh, level playing field. So there's a, a fair bit of to and fro, time constrained between the ratepayers or the campaigners and the Lord Mayor and councillors. They have some influence on what the administration is doing within the plan. The administrators have strong influence on how the plan comes out and you know what is published to the ratepayers. Here is the little engagement arrow from the ratepayers as well. Um, yeah. So it's difficult to influence a self-organizing system from the outside. The, you need to approach through a lot of different channels, a lot of variety. Develop relationships with key individuals, both inside the council and the, uh, the uh, councillors. Develop integrated solutions. So like plant more trees, not a good, not a good suggestion, but plant these sorts of trees in these areas with this management and these species because you know they do these sort of things. That's putting some thought into how the whole system is going to work. Um, it's, it's something that they're more likely to take up. Need to keep the pressure on from outside on using the media and the public forum and develop a few clear messages and promote them constantly over and over again. And our messages were about panels, power purchase agreements and community batteries. I guess our most successful channel in this um, influencing the self-organizing system is through the, the councillors. So we recommend to develop a relationship. I, I, I um, heard a podcast with the Lord Mayor of Indy and one of the, um, the listeners said, how do we influence you? And she says, just talk to us. We're interested. And it's a good, good point. Um, so develop a relationships with the councillors that you can. Approach as many of them as you can help them out so they've, they've got little time for research so what do you want to know you know why don't just say put up panels put up panels for these reasons what is the power purchase agreement um how does it work why is it good how do community batteries work and then work with them to find solutions or recommendations um, for example the power purchase agreement uh, resolution that was accepted with the climate change plan we work with them to develop that resolution. So after all that, did it make a difference? It's actually quite difficult to tell. But what we believe that uh, every action potentially makes a difference. Every council is different. So each of the actions would have a different outcome depending on the councils that you approached. 
So if, you, if we did the same thing again in Newcastle, uh, uh, they've got quite a proactive climate council, would get a very, um, quite a different response. And something must be happening in Dubbo. There's solar panels on about 40% of the roofs that I, I could count. So something's going on up there. If we keep repeating the message, you can only reject a valid concept a number of times. So keep on repeating it and you'll um, finally get your way. Could take a while. What would I do next round? Develop well-designed solutions. And I think ours weren't, weren't too bad, but we need to market them clearer. Organize the campaign and include other groups. So this is the multi-pronged approach a lot of a lot of people coming from a lot of different directions saying the same thing develop a clear marketing message work with more counselors uh, we work with a few we should approach all of them i think and establish dialogue with the general manager of the council stepping back a little bit i had a bit of a think on you know why this might not be working all that well I had a look at the Local Government Act and the Council's charter is to provide directly or on behalf of other levels of government equitable and appropriate services and facilities for the community. To exercise community leadership, to properly manage, develop, protect, you know, build these things and have regard for the long term and cumulative effects of its decisions. So look at the leadership. At the moment, each of us have got our own house, but we need to drive our car to the house. We need someone to build the local roads. So we have a council that we elect and pay, pay fees to. Same for local garbage and recycling services. A bit different, lo local parks. So we need spaces made for them by the council and then installed and maintained for local parks and local planning. So. A new one on the scene now is local emissions reduction. I'm sure each of us in our own house have, have done almost everything that we can to reduce the emissions uh, that we generate in our own operation of our own house. The next thing you need to reduce emissions in is the sy systemic or systematic emissions from the way we run the area. Um, so we need leadership in local emissions reduction. So I believe that the council, it's one of their responsibilities. We need to get that message across. So that's, that's pretty much our story. Um, I've hoped to, con to have conveyed the learnings from a use process, which is quantify and understand the challenge. So what do we really need to make a difference for. Some of the other um, uh, areas have got quite large agricultural contributions to the greenhouse gases. So their actions will be maybe quite different to the Wollongong. Uh, select the most effective and practical ones, things the council can do and have an influence on, and then run a campaign. Constantly market the ideas and build a relationship with councillors. I heard of some research that the most effective emissions reduction occur from the bottom up. Most of them come from the community. The next most effective is the local council, then state government, although our New South Wales government is doing a very good job at the moment with Matt Keane, and the federal government having all over the world, generally not having a, a very large influence. So that's our story and uh, good luck to you. This last slide is just some uh, useful links which, which might help you. Take a screenshot of, shot of that. So we might uh, cross back across and, and take some questions if you like. Here we are. Yeah, thanks Greg, that's fantastic. You guys are also pretty busy down there. Yes, they're revising the plan. So there's another year of the same stuff. Oh, okay. <laughs> New and improved. Yes. Oh, fantastic. Mm. All right, well, I've got a few questions for you from the audience. Mm -hmm. uh, first up, we've got Kim. She's asking, why did the Illawarra Council declare a climate emergency? 
do you have any insight into kind of what pushed them over the edge on that one? Uh, I wasn't involved uh, in that decision. It was like early 2019. Um, it was from pressure from green groups, I guess. Um, I, I think it's not as useful as selecting a target. Mm -hmm. um, what we found is once council to, uh, councils had declared a climate emergency, the, the, often, the catch cry often was, you've declared an emergency and you're not doing this. And that, I find that's not very helpful. But having a target and, and pointing out that they're not making a target is probably quite helpful. Hmm. Okay. Hmm. And um, we've got a few around PPAs and batteries. And we've mm -hmm. got a first one, though. What, what is a, P, a PPA and how does it work? Okay. Um, let's use Canberra as an example. A while ago, they just had the one electrical company, ACTU, ACT energy and water, electricity and water, not sure. Um, but that, so that meant that all of the Canberrans were um, collectively customers of that, that one company. And they said, okay, we want to, want to go green. So they said, right, we will agree to purchase this much electricity, like enough for all of Canberra's day and night usage for the next 10 years. And so they put out a tender to some of these larger engineering companies that, you know, the guys who build wind farms and solar farms and said, right, we're going to buy this much electricity. Let's negotiate how much we'll pay for it. And you build us a wind farm and supply it to us. Hmm. So that contract is called a power purchase agreement. Hmm. And the good thing about it is it causes a uh, new resource, new uh, infrastructure that is renewable. Mm. You, you could get a power purchase agreement for black coal if you wanted to, but it's not, I wouldn't mm. recommend yeah. that. <laughs> I guess you, you're becoming a guaranteed customer for when they go out and install That's, that's right, and yeah. And to sell it to at a fixed price. Yeah. It turns out the biggest player in the whole thing is the bank. Mm. The, 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 they, okay, we're going to put up 100 million yeah, or whatever to build this wind yeah. farm we really do want to know that you're going to pay for it yeah. and you're going to the, the, the engineers are going to build it and you're going to make it run properly mm. So, mm. Right. but it's a very effective way of getting new um, renewable infrastructure mm. and um, i've got quite a few that are a bit more technical from brett who's uh, actually one of our members up here mm -hmm. and if david i can get you to bring him in yeah i think we can just do that now can we just click it mm. Choose just clicking things can you um, ask the question, um, uh, Brett? I think you've got the floor. You can ask it live, Brett. I'll just uh, send send that prompt through. I'm not sure if he's received it. Going to make a cup of tea. <laughs> can you hear me? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes, I can hear you, Brett. Cool. Uh, I just had a few questions. Why did you focus on PPAs? Um, because... Uh, building a PPA helps build a wind farm 500 miles away from Wollongong, but you mm -hmm. lose a lot of energy in the process of shipping it to Wollongong. Wouldn't you be better off investing in the local area and building renewable energy infrastructure in Wollongong? Uh, yes. I don't, we don't have a lot of um, real estate here that's, that's um, amenable to certainly wind farms. Um, a lot of it's water catchment, which would be uh, quite complex to to build things on. Uh, I've personally got a project. I'd, I'd love to have all of our industrial buildings with um, PVs, um, solar panels on them. Um, so I guess our solution was the like Canberra. Canberra's all of their wind farms, they're in from South Australia right up to Queensland. And on the outside of their door, they've got a, a, a reasonable size solar array. So I guess yeah. it's just the mechanism for getting, um, building bulk infrastructure. And what's the economic model for the community? If you have a community PPA, how does that economic model work? Hmm. Um, Oh, for the community. Okay, we 
no, we weren't. We weren't um, trying to get that for the people. We were trying to get that for collective industry groups. Yeah, yeah. But how does that model work? Do oh, they so share a price, or does a PPA um, holder make a margin? This is getting a bit, probably even a bit too technical for me. Um, okay. They, they, they right. would. It's they, okay. they would probably negotiate a collective price for the that they were going to pay for the uh, supplied power and then somehow um, distribute the payment of that the use of that electricity and the payment of that electricity probably like the melbourne model yep. where they've got i think 14 contributors to the power purchase agreement okay and sorry for holding this the community battery work yep. have you have you done any work with the council to identify those areas where you could make community battery investments in terms of suburbs and buildings and locations? Um, the the third guy on our team who we haven't mentioned, Ty Christopher, used to be the uh, asset manager for Endeavour Energy and he gave a talk to Renew Illawarra. He actually installed a community sized battery, I think it's a two megawatt battery in um, one of our newly new suburb development areas. And he's not actually using it as a solar sink, he's using it to um, reduce the poles and wires required for just the peak of that new suburb. So, so it works quite well and it's demonstrated that a community battery will work. So his plan would be to have a number of community batteries within each catchment area, he calls it, like the areas supplied by electrical substation mm -hmm. so that houses could you know, the community battery that the solar panels say from your house would be probably not going much more than two kilometers to charge that battery and the power would be coming two kilometers back to power your house in the dark okay and we, we looked at uh, more than 100 community batteries in the long term for uh, Wollongong would be great they have the a great advantage of keeping Wollongong spends about $150 million as money we have to earn that we pay the power companies that go outside the district. If we were able to pay it to each other or our Endeavour Energy, our um, supplier, and keep it within Wollongong, that has a huge effect on our economy. You know, it keeps it within Wollongong. Yeah. Okay, cool. Good questions, okay. Brett. Mm. Yeah, thanks, Brett. Thanks, Greg. Well answered. So the Brett's a, in like a BPP company and sort of arranges and manages a lot of that. So that's why we're straight into the technicals. On oh, that. okay. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's been a bit he there. needs to be talking to our electrical expert. Yeah, there we go. We'll get him on next time. Yep. Uh, so I've got a question from Kate. Uh, did you feel that having the council declare a climate emergency first was necessary for the success you had? Uh, not absolutely necessary. I think it started them on on the journey. So the journey was declaring a climate emergency. So succumbing to that that pressure from the green groups, saying you know this there is a problem. So they recognised the problem. It that didn't. Um, I don't think it made the first resolution. It had to go through a few council meetings before it finally got up. Then they signed on to the global covenant of mayors. So the 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 um, psychology is changing, they're starting to get greener. Then they've decided to revise their climate change plan, which I think they had one of like 2011. Uh, and so that progression helped. So I guess it's the psychology of change. Mm -hmm. It's not an essential thing to have, but it was one of the stepping stones. Mm. So the ball's been rolling in the background for quite a while then on that one? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Cool. All right. And um, got a question from Ashna regarding the complex self-organizing systems mm -hmm. um, they referred to earlier. Yep. Uh, so what is like the overall attitude of the general public that these changes will influence regarding sustainability action? Sorry, say again. So when, when you were talking to the public, yep. how yes. did they yes. sort of receive um, the changes you wanted to, to enact? Oh, uh, they're generally quite supportive. I think the, the public do... The scary thing about climate change and especially the way that we've promoted the gloom and doom is everybody feels helpless. Mm. So they do their own things for their own house 
and still they feel helpless. Mm. If if we can have some orchestrated things that make a quite a significant difference, uh, they're pretty happy to take that on, and will support it. Probably, this, you know, they don't get a chance to vote against it, but um, you know, they'll if you interview the ministry. Yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. Keep going. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, you yeah. keep going for us, you know. So the council, that, and that's why I'm wanting the council to take that leadership. You know, if you're going to reduce our greenhouse footprint, that'd be great. Mm. And I think they'd be quite supportive of that. Yeah, because mm. I like exactly what you mean with that, like defeatist and sort of nihilistic attitude. It was actually like violently hub just here. Right. This yep. Electrified by Saul Griffin. Um, so he's like an Australian entrepreneur. And he's a really good interview a couple of years ago now with Ezra Klein. It's a great podcast. Mm -hmm. And he kind of talks about how sort of the green movement has been very pessimistic over the last 10, 20 years. It's been, you know, do go without, go with less, you know, live mm -hmm. like a very small footprint in life. It's all your own responsibility. Yep. And um, he kind of argues against that like very well. And it's, um, I highly recommend it to, to everyone that I, that I talk to. Yep. So we, we have Sol Griffiths in our electorate. So he lives oh, just go. up the road. And oh, we've got a meeting of uh, some climate activists from Southeast Australia trying to figure out how we could get his pilot program in our area. I don't know whether we'll succeed, but you know, mm. that part that changes the psychology of, you know, mm. starts the, the ball rolling. Mm. Mm. Okay. And then Ash has got a second part to a question asking about uh, the social media, like, so mm -hmm. what platforms are you using? And um, how effective are you finding that at building pressure, like internally and externally to council? Uh, I think we get a big F for that. <laughs> <laughs> where, where, where uh, generally, I find the most of the climate activists are um, quite young or quite wise, like myself, um, because the other people paying off houses and having babies that really don't have time. Mm. We're not great with social media <clears throat> and we knew we could get some more leverage, but we didn't have any young people coming along with us to, to do that. So uh, I'm sure you could do that to great advantage. And we've got a young lady from the uni at the moment with heading up the Illawarra Climate Coalition. I gave a talk to them the other week. Mm. Um, they are starting to make some inroads with, with their audience. Oh, okay. mm. yeah, so yes, use it, but we I have no experience. <laughs> mm. All right, uh, I've got one more from Graham. Um, I'm going to assume this is with PPAs um, and batteries, Graham, so correct me if I'm wrong, but how do customers and community owners pay for their electricity? Is there like a registered community owner, a community retailer? Um, you're saying there's often a bit of difficulty with the regulation. Um. Sorry, can you just simplify and ask the question again? Yeah, sure. Yeah. How do we get Graham to ask it directly? Mm. Graham, can you ask yeah. that address directly? Um, let's see if we can mm. get you to... Um... Oh, yeah, okay. Great. Um, yeah, Greg, um, fascinating. Hi, Graham. Um, we've looked here in the Gold Coast a little bit about um, connecting up behind the meter systems. Unfortunately, the reg regulations have, have beaten us entirely um, to give access to customers connecting to embedded generation and customers connecting to each other yes. using the uh, distribution network. Um, and the, there just doesn't seem to be a way to bypass um, distribution charges yeah. and um, registered retailers, et cetera, et cetera, which just kill the profit margin of anything. Yes on a community yeah. basis. I'm just wondering mm. the process that you went through to um, to bypass that, what you're looking at to bypass that. Uh, we, we looked at that that region and way too complicated, so we sidestepped that. What we're looking for is probably a company, and we might not even do it th that way again now, put out a tender for, what's it called, uh, request for expression of interest for someone to, to build a battery, develop a relationship with our um, supplier who happened to be in Endeavour Energy so that they could um, trade on the electricity market and trade backwards and forwards and have their own, it will probably be what's known as a gen tailor, a generator mm. and a retailer in the one company. 
and then they can develop relationships with the actual consumers. Um, that's about all I know. <laughs> so it could work. That was designed by our electrical specialist. Yeah, I, I, I suspect that's going to be a really significant hurdle. Um, mm. But I'd, I'd just love to know if you can make that work. No. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's early days and I'm sure... Yes, it is early days. Yes, it, it will come. Yeah. It's a necessary part of your plan. Um, yes. Mm. And I, th I think that the regulations are actually moving in the wrong direction now to, to make it even harder to, to develop community electricity systems. Yes, the... An interesting, well, there is one huge hurdle that the government refuses to correct, which they could do with a stroke of a pen, is the rule that the local distributors are not allowed to generate, i.e. they're not allowed to have a battery. Um, and and th that benefits the big grid. Um, so one of the, we're campaigning to try and get that hurdle knocked down and, and I'll, be good to have it Australia-wide or a new government or something which might see sense. Once um, we've got a uh, distributor up in Sydney called Ausgrid who've got a, a battery experiment occurring and they manage the battery. They, you can, uh, let's, let's say you're buying a 10 kilowatt battery which costs you about a thousand dollars a year to pay off, you know, before you're getting any payback. Uh, Osgrid can rent you that 10 kilowatts of space for $400. And why can they do that? Because they have the capability to, to charge and sell that battery twice a day. So they're really utilizing it. Um, and that is the efficient way to do. So you end up with the distributed energy resources where your local areas can look after themselves. You don't have to put up huge grid, more grid power lines to uh, uh, connect, you know, the Wollongong's looking after itself with a number of small batteries, smaller batteries connected, and we're charging and discharging them with our own areas. Given that, you don't have to charge about half of our 22 cents for power is um, grid charges. Mm. If we're in the local area network, we don't, we don't have to pay all of those grid charges, probably have to pay just some sort of network charge. Mm. All right. Yeah, thanks, Graham. Hmm. Right. Good question, Ryan. Yeah. Yeah. So it's coming up on the hour. Um, yeah. So I want to thank you again, uh, Greg, for your time, for coming down and, well, coming online and <laughs> telling us everything and your experience and, and all your insights. It's been really fantastic. Like, uh, I really appreciate you taking the time for us. Thank, thank you very you. much. Yeah. I've enjoyed doing it. And uh, thanks to Neville for writing the first article and, and um, hmm. letting you become aware. So yeah, no, I'd, no, I'd like to there. set up a sister or what is it, a um, partnership, Gold Coast, Renew Illawarra, mm -hmm. just keep keep our network going and yeah, yeah, see if we can build on each other. Thank you. Yeah, yeah I like the sounds of that. Yeah, mm. and thank you to everyone that came along this evening. Um, yeah, it's great that you got to spend the hour with us tonight and kind of learn a bit and I kind of, you know, really hope you got something out of it.